Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, and more importantly, gamers all over the world, welcome back to another rendition of BA Select Start. Base. We are back again with another episode. We pretty much stated on the last episode that the next time that we come your way, we're going to be doing a Last of Us Part 2 review. The long-awaited review. Before we get into anything, full disclosure, guys, we will be talking about spoilers and where the story goes and what the ending is. So if you have not completed the game or if you do not plan on completing the game anytime soon, I suggest that you click away from the episode. Once again, I repeat, there will be spoilers in this video. So if you still haven't played the game, click away from the video right now. Yeah, we're, we're going to talk real in depth, so... Y'all, y'all might want a piece. <laughs> yeah. So, Dan, this is actually not our first time getting our feelings out there. I know that I got a little bit of a slow start uh, for Last of Us Part Two. Uh, fair to say that you sort of dove in and. Oh, I I killed that game in three days. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I took I took I think I probably took double that time to do so. Um, just because I felt like I wasn't in the proper mindset to absorb everything in, so I had to kind of give myself some time. But when I finally had the chance to pull off 12-hour gameplay, um, what do you call it? Slots? Yeah, sessions. Um, I was then able to really dive into the story, and I was actually, fair to say, like I was kind of giving you side commentary through text as I was going along, telling you how I was feeling um yeah but you, you, the, fu the funny thing for me is like i don't do a lot of those like super late night gaming sessions like sometimes i'll play and i'll, I'll it'll be like 1 30 maybe or two when i quit but uh, i the first night i i think i started early which is why i tapped out at like 12 30 or something but then the the second day I started later and I played until four thirty and then the day after I went till five thirty and then you told me one of your days that you played till four and I was like well you know I guess that's just the cool the cool kid thing to do with this game yeah when you think about it there's a little bit of circumstance because once again these are the times of the coronavirus so you know going back to work for me is still sort of at a slow pace. Every place is shut down, so it's like more than ever now, if there's a new video game coming out on the block, what do you do? You just put that sucker into the console and you play it for hours. Yeah, um, and, I, and I know that a lot of, I mean, I, I'm just going to toss this out there, I'm not going to delve too deep into it. I know a lot of people had things spoiled for them, uh, one way or another. You even warned me, I don't know if you exp expressed anything spoiled or if you just knew spoilers were popping up, but I... I was lucky enough to where I didn't encounter one spoiler outside of, like, as it turned out, what we had already speculated about. But I went in clean, and I, I finished the game before I came across anything. And shit, it, even the reviews that I went and was looking at after the fact, other than the things I was seeking out, I never accidentally came across, like, a random page that said, uh, said anything. <laughs> Yeah, me neither. I was I was forewarned by another friend of mine who's also a big fan of the series, and at certain points he would tell me, hey, just be careful going online because there's people dropping information. Even when the game first released, I was staying away from social media as much as I could because inevitably it pops up, especially when it's a new game. It hits all the trending you know, all the trending videos and articles and blogs and posts, you know, Last of Us Part 2, Last of Us Part 2, because it's so fresh. So I had to make sure that I was staying away from everything until completion of the game. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that I would say is uh, not to not to victim blame in this situation, but uh, like I follow at least two pages about The Last of Us on Instagram and uh, I would see their posts, and I would just scroll past instead of going into the comments, so I'm sure that's part of how I avoided everything. <laughs> yeah, uh, the comments section is where I also was forewarned that's going to be the biggest place, and my buddy told me, he said, on YouTube videos or on Facebook posts or Instagram posts, 
Just do not read the comment section. Just stay away from it until you complete the game, just to be on just oh, to yeah. be on the same side. So now that I think about it, I think part of that part, part of it's why I played the game so quickly. I don't think I went on YouTube in those three days, so that probably <laughs> that probably helped. Yeah, it's it's one of those things where you have to be careful because sometimes even you know in the thumbnails of videos, people will put text where it says. Last of Us ending, uh, explanation of why Joel died, and it's like, you know, just by reading that... Well, there's our first spoiler. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I, I forewarned everybody at the beginning, so... Uh, no, I know, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm joking. Yeah. Yeah, or like the one that I sent you that uh, says Ellie kills Abby, alternate ending. Yeah, uh, whether it's... Fun, Which I know is, again, not canon, it's not, it's not the actual ending or anything that you can do... But <laughs> yeah, but I mean, inevitably in today's day and age, when a new game or a new film or anything comes out, you just you got to be careful because, uh, and and that's another thing too. I don't get where the motive is for people to destroy the game for others. Like if you come, well, I mean, uh, uh, if you go back to to the Dark Knight, uh, I think it, I think it's the the Joker. I could be misquoting it, but or no, it's um, sorry, it's Alfred. Some men just want to watch the world burn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and I, I believe also I I watched a video before release of Troy Baker sort of uh, talking right to the camera in one of his po and one of his blogs going I don't understand I don't understand like what what kind of a kick people get out of doing that ruining the game for others if you want to yeah. if you want to read spoilers and find out what happens ahead of time go ahead but don't ruin it for yeah. everybody else who's been waiting for it for years. I like Troy. He seems he seems like a, like a nice guy. I, I was watching videos recently, and I, I there was one where he was talking about how the scene where Sarah dies in the first one. Yes. He went he went into the you, you may have seen this at some point, but he goes into the first day of shooting and he just breaks down on on the set because he wanted yeah. he, he the way the way he puts it is Ego. I wanted to show everybody the, how good of an actor I was. I wanted them to go, man, this guy's so good. Yeah. And then Neil ended up bringing them back to reshoot that scene and said, I need you to break it down. I need you to do this, 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 and this, and that's the take that they ended up going with. Right. So, yeah. He, so he seemed really humble from from that experience. Like he seemed like he was really full of himself before, and then that kind of grounded him to make him go, "Oh shit, I I was so blinded by by my own desire to be like, oh Troy's so talented that I wasn't giving the character the justice it deserved." Yeah, I mean, speaking about Troy, and not only Troy, everybody else on cast: Ashley Johnson, Neil Druckmann. Uh, Jeffrey Pierce, I believe his name is, the guy who plays Tommy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Nolan North, everybody. It just seems like... Laura, in this one, Laura Bailey. Laura Bailey. Um, am I forgetting? Those are the main people. I can't remember. Uh, unfortunately, I can't remember the actor, the actress's names for Tess and uh, Marlene or um, I think Stephen Ch Chang played Jesse. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, well, I, let me just, let me group it all together. Anyone who was a part of the Naughty Dog uh, acting yeah. team for the, for both games. All the performers. All of the performers, yeah. It seems like everybody is humble. I, I, like, when you see some of the BTS videos, which I frequently go back and watch for obvious reasons, you never get the vibe that anybody is, like, egotistical or out of control or needs to have, you know, themselves checked at the door. Um, everybody yeah, seems... And everybody seems to get along, and you know how when sometimes you've got somebody who's got a big ego, everyone's like, eh, I don't really like that guy. Yeah, it's it's funny. I'm going to quickly bring this up, and then we can jump into the review itself. But going to university, uh, trying to study film, usually you would hear how in every single semester you would have, you know, it would be you and all your classmates and usually you would come across the one guy who would try to impress the professor by giving statistics or trying to be a Mr. I-know-it-all and trying to prove to the professor, hey, I know everything about everything. Um, I mean, I don't want to attack people who know things, but don't be pretentious about it. <laughs> yeah, uh, don't, don't throw it in everybody's face that you know, like, you know, you know everything about everything. It's like... I'll, I'll, I'll tell a quick story about that in a second, but go ahead. 
But no, I mean, yeah, that, that's just the gist of it is that you would usually come across the one guy. And I'm not just saying this just to be protective of my own, uh, you know, classmates or whatever. But the semester that I landed into, the beautiful part is that there really wasn't anybody who had that, who was egotistical or, you know, thought that they, they, they knew everything about everything. Everybody was very humble and just very helpful. But when I would get to meet some of the kids from the other semesters, you would see a, a person or two where it's like, oh, this is one of those guys, you know, who thinks he knows yeah. everything. But no, yeah, go ahead. Well, mine, mine's just in one of my creative writing classes in college. <laughs> um, nobody liked to be mean to each other. We, we, we were constructive. Most of it, we, like, we were mostly respectful respectful about the whole the whole process oh this thing didn't really work this could have been better i liked this that everybody was real chill there was one kid and he um first of all you look at him and you go you're you're a schmuck (laughs) and and he just like he always would kind of when he was thinking he'd put the pen against against his forehead and be like "Hmm," and, and you're like chill but he sent him one of his pieces and uh he had submitted some stuff for to to two publishers before i don't know if he ever really published anything but he submitted one of his stories and i had conversations with other people in the class and we were like this is not good i was gonna be really mean there for a second but this is not good yeah and then we got to the comment section the like feedback portion and i don't i could be wrong but i think i opened the floodgates <laughs> Because I was a little harsh with him. I was like, I, I'm, I'm going to give you part of my actual critique. Uh, I, I'm not crazy about the color coordination you gave the characters because it has sort of a Power Ranger feel to it. And it, it was like, a, it was. I, I don't want to delve too much in, into the specifics because if he ever hears this, he'll know it's him. But it was about some people with some powers and they were color coordinated. And I was like, two of them by skin tone no less and i was like i don't like that i don't think that that's a good plot device it doesn't make me like these people and then everybody cut into him he but he was out in the hall at least looking very dejected (laughs) and we we like i talked to a couple people while we were on break and we were like oh god we were so mean to him (laughs) so yeah i mean don't 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 come across like a dick, and then you won't get that shit. (laughs) You know that old expression, or or that old TV show, Leave It to Beaver? Yeah. In my eyes now, it's just leave it to Dan. You know, just leave (laughs) it to Dan to open up the floodgates and just allow everybody to tear into the guy. Um, Yeah, I didn't do it on purpose, but uh, I I think he's, I'd like to think he's a better person now for it. Yeah, well, I mean, who's to say that maybe that wasn't his sort of Troy Baker moment, you know, where he kind yeah. of had to bring himself down. Uh, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. I don't know. Bless the guy. But um, I, I think that, we, like, especially when it comes into writing, and that's why I think I love about Neil Druckmann the most, is that he's not married to his story verbatim. He's always open for his actress or his actors or his actresses to be like, hey, what if we tried this or can, yeah. we, can we go this way or this is how I interpret it. I, I never got the vibe that, that, that he was one of those guys where he's like, no, that's wrong. You will do it this way. That's how it's written and that's how it's going to be. So Yeah, and the, and the per, like something I, I learned in uh, theater school is that as a director, you should never tell your perform you should never tell your performer how to act. Yeah. Which I, I know sounds like a weird thing. Um, but you should never be like, say the line like this. Um, but the fact that Troy praised him, has praised him, and then I don't know if you've seen Ashley's acceptance speech at yes, the BAFTA. Yes, 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 yes. At yes. the Game Awards. And she goes, Neil Druckmann, my cap- oh, Captain, my captain. Yes. So there's a respect with all of these people, and they, they trust his competence. So, I mean, I don't want to... I don't want to. I mean, we'll talk more in depth about the game, but I, I don't want to attack Neil for for how things played out with this one, uh, because again, we've talked. We, at the last comment we made before we actually got on here, um, the 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 story at the core is not a bad story. So I mean, good on Neil for that. However, 
the execution, whether that's within his grasp or not, didn't exactly land. But we'll go into more detail as we go. Yes, so I think that this is probably a good place to, to start. We've kind of talked about backstory and, uh, you know, relating to various actors or, you know, Neil himself. But getting into it, uh, you and I, we talked, Dan, about The Last of Us. We talked about the, the first one. We, pre- mm-hmm. we previewed everything under the sun before the game yes. came out. We talked ad nauseum almost. Like, I love the game, but we talked about it a lot. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, every new detail that came out, whether it was, it was good, bad, or indifferent, we covered it, we gave our review, and I think that there was a, a lot of excitement and hype and anticipation. And then the game came out. Um, well, I'll let, I mean, I'll let you steer this this part because I know I know where we where we each kind of stand in general. So I'll let you you open this one. Okay. Well, first of all, let me just say that I think it's a testament to how we personally feel about the series. I mean, you know, you and I are friends. I got the collector's edition. You got the Ellie edition. So I think that tells you we're not just two of them. <laughs> Well, I mean, you were just looking out for yourself because, uh, no, <laughs> you know, those pre-orders uh, have known to become a bit of a problem. Yeah. But, um, okay, so again, give credit where credit's due. Last of Us Part Two, graphic-wise, mechanics-wise, great. I have no complaints there. It is, it looks beautiful, stunning. You could tell that they certainly went into detail in making sure that everything makes sense. Um, you know, certain things like characters walking through the snow or running in open areas or, you know, they, they, they've taken the time to, to make sure that everything feels alive as opposed to, yeah. you know, uh, copy paste backgrounds and, and whatnot. Which was, which was a big part of my playthrough. I, like I, I, like I told you, I, I probably could have beaten the game faster, but I was exploring the environment because, uh, I wanted to see what they'd done, and there's so much, there's so much in that game, and so so many details and places that you can be, uh, and the model, the modeling. Who, wh- whichever members of the team were in charge of modeling the environment, crushed it. It's amazing. Yes, from that perspective, absolutely, they nailed it. I'm not going to take any credit away. They they've taken the time, the the acting, the voice acting, yeah. and everything in between. <clears throat> Is on point. I don't think anybody, you know, no matter what your thought is, you you can't argue that they did, you know, a, a top notch job of, of of the whole thing. Yeah. Like I sh- I showed the first conversation between uh, Joel and Ellie to somebody who hasn't actually played the first one, and um, <laughs> I'm not going to identify this person, but they they uh, they found themselves. Uh, almost uncomfortably attracted to the awkwardness of Joel. <laughs> and I, I thought it was funny, but like Troy, Troy's delivery during that scene in particular, and then just anytime Joel was on screen, you're like, damn, he, he, he landed that. He, he has such an affection for that character that he knows how to breathe life into him. And this is a, like, at this point, Joel is an old, he's an older guy. He knows that he's on. He's walking on eggshells with Ellie, and it was it was beautifully embodied. And then you have you have Ashley, who's always done a great job with Ellie. She she understands and, and lives the character when she's there. And uh, I know I always kind of pinpoint these three, but like even though even if you don't like the character of Abby. Laura did a really, really good job as that character. Her delivery, her emotion, it was, it was all really good. Um, so yeah, I, I, I want to praise all of the performers that were in this game. Yes, uh, they all did a really good job. One thing that I will throw in there as well is, dare I say this, but I think Joel might be the hardest character for all, like out of the three because when you really consider the age difference of Troy Baker, he's a young guy. He's not, you yes. know, he, he's not, he's still in his prime. But he's taking, hey. he's taking on the role of someone who's... Like, how, how old is Joel supposed to be about around this time? Like, he's, um, he's, he's graying at this point, and 
what was the time gap from when Sarah died to to the quarantine? Twenty or thirty? So it was twenty years, and then the events of the first Last of Us and the second one, I think, is Take is them. is real time. So twenty seven years. Yeah, so we're about twenty seven years. So he's he's mid to late fifties at this point. But when you think about it, and I actually noticed this very very recently. Um, I was playing the first one right before the release of the second one, and I thought about it. I'm like, you know. There are so many moments where Troy has to keep in mind the deep breaths, you know, the, you know, because if, if he says his lines just casually as Troy Baker, you're going to be like, wait a second, how is Joel so agile in, in his talking? How is he delivering all these lines without taking, uh, you know, a, a breath? Because, you know, a, a, a late 50s guy does not speak the same way as someone who's Troy's age. So yeah. you have to keep all that in mind. You know, it's like Ashley, she's young and Ellie is young. Laura Bailey is young. Abby is young. So I'm not saying that those roles are easy, but I just feel like with Joel, there's a whole lot more that you have to sort of look into like between the lines type of thing if you get where I'm coming from. Yeah, especially if you listen to Troy talk versus Joel, that's not Troy's voice. Yeah, he's got he's got like a graveliness in there, and he's he has intentionally aged it. And um, something that, as an actor, I always think about. I have I've not been lucky enough to find myself cast in like a television show. But not yet. I've, but I've thought. Thank you. <laughs> but I, I've, I've thought about the difficulty that would come with having to uh, remember and maintain a specific character's mindset from episode to episode. When God knows if you're filming an episode a week uh, to film the stuff, or if you're filming several days in a week uh, in a row, but to maintain the mentality of that character over the course of like, for example, friends, 10 seasons. Yeah. Staying in the mindset of Rachel green or Ross Geller for 10 seasons seems like a, a daunting task. Staying in the mind of Joel without doing it for seven years. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it makes it even more impressive that, that he, uh, specifically he and Ashley came back and like Ellie, I didn't feel a difference between yeah. the original game and this one. Right. I think Ashley maintained the, the character very, very well. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So uh, again, my, my hat's off to these guys, all of them, not just Troy and Ashley, everybody, because... Yeah. Uh, you know, like I, I even want to give credit to one second to Nolan North. He goes from playing Nathan Drake in, in four games to playing, you know, the, the creepy villain in David in the first Last of Us. Um, and how a lot of people didn't even know that that was Nolan North until the credits rolled in the first game. They're like, wait a second, David was Nolan North because it's such a departure from Nathan Drake or even Nolan North's, you know, normal voice. So. You know, my again, my hat's off to these guys. Like, these guys, they got a bright future, you know, whether it's in video games or films or, or whatever it is. But to, to, to get back to, to the review itself, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start my review by just sort of talking about pacing. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to try so desperately to not compare it to the first game, but I almost have to because that's my only lead. I felt like the first game, it does everything correctly, and specifically, the one thing that it does the best is pacing. The second, when you're fighting off hunters or fireflies or whatever you're doing, it seems like the pacing of giving the player a deep breath is spaced out very sporadically and very well, to the point where if you're having a, a, an optional conversation with Ellie in the first game, and, okay, there gets to a point where it's like, okay, the game is, is slowing down a bit, okay. All of a sudden, you get into what I like to call a get down Ellie moment where, you know, they're walking and Joel goes, Ellie, get down, get underneath something. Yeah, the, the, the moment where they're, they're listening to the audio recording next right. to the skeleton and then they look down, they see the lights and they go, he goes, get down. And then there's a gunshot and then you have to escape the building. Yeah, there's that. There's the one right before when they reach the um the the fancy hotel. There is um, oh, I'm, try, I'm trying to think. It, it's it, it's been a moment. Um, <coughs> like like the parts with Tess, 
you know, where you're kind of, you're, you're getting a little tutorial and then all of a sudden you, you meet, you, you come across those first three guys and Tesco's, uh, we're looking for Robert and then you, you fend those guys off, you walk a little bit and then you got a, a few more guys that you gotta, you gotta fight off until you finally get to Robert and then from Robert, you know, we go to meet Ellie. So everything is paced very, very well. However, in the second game, mentally, I have tapped out. Physically, I was still going. I was still playing the game. Um, Last of Us 2 is very poorly p uh, paced. I'm, I'm, I'm not even talking about like uh, after Joel's death, even before Joel's death. Yeah. I, I feel like there was too much of, we're in Jackson, everything is good, we've, we've built a life here, everything is safe, and alright, good times, and what did you think of the kiss last night, and get on the horse, and this and that. Uh, I sort of thought about it, I'm like, you know in the first game, the only moment that's peaceful is the first two minutes, and that's only a cutscene. After the first two minutes, we're into it. It's, it's going, you know? Yeah. And I just felt like in this one... There were a lot, like, for example, the, the stuff with, with Adina, where it was, oh, we have to get the power resort to the generator, so you have to play for about 30 or 40 minutes, you have to get to the bank, then, okay, we get the generator, we uh, go in and we get the gate open, okay, now we gotta go find this thing over here, well, okay, so we're gonna have to go maneuver our way around for another 45 minutes and then come back to that one area, um, or just even, like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of jump around here, even the moments with Abby, you know, going to that hospital, getting the medicine, uh, getting out of the hospital, and just, it just, the pacing of it was so off. It, it's such a long game, and I know, you know, before release, in my mind, it was the longer the better, because this is Last of Us. It's our favorite game in the whole world. But, 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 your, but your thought process was the longer the story, the better. And so, like, on this point, I'll, I'll side with you. Because there was a lot of gameplay that didn't lead to anything. Yeah. Um, like I'll I'll use that specific thing as an example. You mentioned the 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 bank, or um, I, I don't think it's technically a bank. There's the the synagogue and the um, the hell's the other place? Uh, the dome. You know when you yeah when you're trying to get the gas. Yeah. Um. I don't like. I don't want. <laughs> uh, I I think the problem is there wasn't enough. There weren't enough story elements to justify the amount of of empty gameplay that they did, which I've talked to you about. Where I said I would have rather the travel be shorter. We get to a plot point, and then things like you use Leia in the Leah in the story instead of killing her off before you meet her. Yeah. Um. Because I don't want to. I don't want to, like you said, it was a really long time. I don't want to play 25 minutes to get to the to the gas canister in the synagogue and have it be empty. <laughs> I, would, I would rather that you have me go to one gas canister, luck into it being full, and then we move on with the story. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if maybe this is what kind of killed it for me. I don't know if maybe it was a case of me being inside of my own head, but my first thought process was, if I ever want to play this game again, I have to go through all this again. You know yeah. that that's that that's just that's just where my mind went at first. But because the first thing that I'm thinking is okay, replay value. How much replay value is this really gonna have? There, there's as some as somebody who has been playing devil, devil's advocate with you this entire time. There's not a lot. I'm gonna be honest. There's not a lot of replay value on this one. And I think part of it is because there's so much empty, burned time. I could play the first one over and over and over again because yes. the pacing is better in that one. Yes. Uh, but this one, I likened it to The Lord of the Rings, and I, I hope some of the viewers will understand this reference. I don't like the, the Lord of the Rings movies, specifically Fellowship of the Rings, because, or Fellowship of the Ring, because there's so much travel. I... I I'm not watching the movie to watch the characters walk places. Yeah. Yeah. I'm watching the movie to enjoy the story. And watching 15 minutes of them walking along a mountainside pisses me off. 
Yeah, I'm really happy that you brought that up because there's two points that I want to make. Uh, you and I, Dan, we, you know, we're trying to get into the film business. So I'm sure you've heard of that expression where anytime when you write a script, people or professors or peers will always tell you, show, don't tell. And yeah. in my mind, this game, not that it, not that it does that, but in my mind, it was... You know, you come across a lot of, and this is not, I, I don't want this to be a knock on just student films because who's to say that feature length films don't do this as well. But you have a lot of films where it's, oh, we're going to have two characters who are either sitting down at a table or standing up by a doorway and they're going to talk and they're just, they're going to tell the viewer what's going on through speech and they're just going to, they're just going to fill up time by just talking. And that's what I felt like Naughty Dog did here. There were so many sections, again, this goes back to the pacing, where whether it was you and Dina, whether it was Abby and Owen, whether it was, mm, I don't know who else, but so many moments where either when you're walking in snow or you're riding horses or you're, you know, walking through lakes, so many moments where it's, oh, we're going to walk and talk for the next 10 minutes. And guess what? You can't run through this section. You you are forced to do the slow walk and listen to every single detail. Yeah, which, which honestly, on a first playthrough, I don't have a terrible um, complaint about because I want to absorb the story. But to have to do that in, in uh, consecutive uh, run-throughs is, te- is going to be tedious. Yeah. Um, because yeah, even mentioning what you what you said, you have that first scene with Abby and Owen when they wake up at the lodge and they go out to the mountainside and they go, oh look at the look at that city. That must be where where he's at. Um, yeah, and then Owen pisses off and she goes and sets everything into motion. But uh, yeah, the 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 it, that's a prime example that scene of that uh, telling not showing because they're just standing there <laughs> talking about yeah he must be here na 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 all the revenge whatever I don't remember the dialogue yeah but yeah it's it's walking it's uh, and it doesn't can it doesn't really contribute anything to the to the story I would almost have preferred that because I think Abby's staring out the window initially and then he wakes up and walks over. I'd rather that she just wake up and be like, hmm, I'm going to sneak out for a minute. Uh, or he, d- did he say I found something? Is yeah. that what his thing yeah, was? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would have rather she just see Jackson through the, fi- sorry, through the window um, <laughs> and be like, oh, look, that's the city. I'm going to go look. And then she wanders off and Owen's like, where the hell did Abby go? That yeah. would be better. Yeah. Um, uh, one, one thing that I wanted to throw in there as well is there's also that, that other uh, criticism that a lot of scripts get where it is, you know, if you have a scene in a movie or in a script or in a video game or whatever it is, is it necessary? Does it take the plot anywhere? Can you get rid of it and have your story still continue? And I'm going to be sarcastic when I say this, but I don't know if maybe Neil Druckmann or if Naughty Dog completely forgot about that because of how long and how, you know, extensive and dreadful everything is. Honestly, when I think about it, I would much rather for all the section that you have to play with Abby, I would rather that one moment where she has Ellie at gunpoint and fades to black, I would rather have a 10 minute cutscene that encompasses everything. And you can have, you know, um, Abby sort of narrate in her mind the whole thing of what happened. Oh, it, it was going to be the cure for humanity. Then they decided to kill my father. And, you know, I mean, of course, they, they would have a little bit more convincing, you know, uh, screenplay than, than what I just drummed yeah. up. But, you know, to, I don't even know. Somebody made the, the comment that you play as Abby for 12 hours. And in my yeah, which mind, is, which is half the game. Yeah, and I mean, <laughs> there was a point where I told you I feel like I'm not even playing Last of Us anymore. I feel like I'm playing what Lost Legacy was to Uncharted. That's what I feel like I'm playing. Like, oh, um, Last of Us, you know, um, Road to to Scar Island. You know, like, well, you feel like yeah. it's a it's a sub series. It's not the main thing. 
And I think that's mostly because of how long he plays her consecutively. If they if they if they changed the the order of of the story a little bit, like I I I, I wouldn't have liked it being jump uh, Ellie Abby Ellie Abby Ellie Abby the whole game. But if you changed that up a little bit to where you did like Ellie 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 Abby Abby Ellie Abby Abby. Some sort of more uh, dynamic transitionary order. Yeah. In, yeah. Instead of saying, "Okay, you're going to play as Ellie all the way up to the 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 hell the gunpoint scene, and then you're going to be Abby for twelve hours," um, that's it, it's irritating, especially especially because the the problem with that is that we a lot of us bought into the game to play as Ellie or Joel, not knowing what the plot was. We, ex- we we wanted to play as the characters we loved. Yes. So, I don't, like, I, I genuinely think if you'd split up that Abby portion with some more Ellie, people wouldn't be acting so aggressively toward this. Because they, yeah. they would have been like, okay, well, I played as Abby for two scenes, and now I'm back with Ellie. That would have been fine. <laughs> Yeah, I even brought up the bright idea, and by the way, I Neil Druckmann, unless if he's lying, has officially confirmed that there will not be any DLC, but if I could play their, their marketing leader for just one second, I thought that if you, you know, let's say if you give, um, you know, that, that five or ten minute cutscene in the actual game for Abby... And then everybody plays the game, they beat it, they go, oh, okay, for example, Ellie gets gets to kill Abby, all is good in the world, cool. And then once the game is out, sort of like what they did with Left Behind, you go, okay, well, what if we try to give you a different perspective through somebody else's eyes? And, and then all that 12-hour gameplay, they lump it into a DLC and go, here you go. Why don't you purchase this DLC and you get an alternative perspective into The Last of Us? I feel like that would be a whole lot more ethical as opposed to, no, we're going to force you to play essentially Joel's killer. And even though you've known these characters for seven years, you're going to try to feel sympathetic for uh, someone who you met two hours ago. It just, that it, everything in this game is so out of character when it comes to Neil Druckmann and Naughty Dog. It's like, I wouldn't have expected this from them. And I think that's what gives me such a shock value. But I, I want to chime in real quick and get your opinion on how you, what you think of this. Because I, I think we're in consensus that the plot order is, the, is, is probably the biggest problem with the game. First off, do you, do you, think, do you, do you agree with that? For the most part, yes. Okay. Now, hypothetically... What if, what, and I, I still don't, wouldn't want, want to do it for 12 hours in a row, what if we had started off with Abby's backstory at the beginning of the game? Like, what if we what if we played, and I mean the backstory, I don't mean the shit in Seattle. What if we had established who she is and why she's seeking revenge before we ever got to her killing Joel? Do you think that you would feel more sympathetic for her leading up to the killing of Joel as opposed to killing him first and then introducing why she's doing it. In all honesty, I don't think it would have made a difference for me personally because... Not, not at all? Not at all. Because in my mind, it would be, okay, you know... So I just want to make sure I understand you correctly. You're saying that right when the game opens, you're essentially playing as Abby. Is that what you're saying? That's what, yeah, that's what I'm proposing to get your, your thought process on it. Because I think if you open the game, and people would still be jarred by it initially, but I'm saying if you open on the thing where she runs down the hallway to the surgical room and finds her dad dead, or even the thing where we see her uh, slide down in the mud and he's there and she throws mud at him and then we have that little familial banter. And then we go to the hospital. If we build that whole thing first, like in the first hour, which is still excessive because I feel like a lot of Last of Us fans wouldn't want to play 
as a new character for a full hour before we get to the people we like. Because, honestly, I really liked the way that this game started with um, Ellie and, and Jesse and them. I don't have a problem with the pacing of the first part, which I think you kind of mentioned you did. Um, yeah. Um, that would be my chief complaint, is what you said right there, is, you know, uh, so if I'm all hyped for Last of Us Part 2, but all of a sudden, that first hour, I'm not playing as Joel, I'm not playing as uh, Ellie, I'm not playing as anybody that I've come to know in the series, in my mind, it would be, okay, well, why am I supposed to give a damn? I'm like, okay, I'm sorry you lost your dad, but guess what? A lot of other people have also, you know, experienced loss in this fictitious world as well. Whether that's, you know, directly, indirectly, or rightfully so, or innocently, or whatever the deal is. Um, so, yeah. personally for me, I... Mean, my, I thought, my thought process is that in doing that, you get an introduction to the character before we dive right into her killing him. So it would almost be like I would almost say, oh, I like honestly, based I'm because I'm just in my head, kind of recutting the game. Yeah, and I I don't know exactly how to cut it well, but like if we do, like maybe get rid of the the actual lodge scene, or uh, you could probably intersperse stuff better. Um, but hypothetically, let's say we start the game. And you're playing as Abby, and you're kind of like, oh, well, who's this character, and why am I playing as her instead of Ellie or Joel? Yeah. I think that builds a little bit of curiosity about the character. Maybe we just do the first two, like the first two chunks where you see her and her dad interacting, and you're like, this is weird. Who are these people? Then you get to maybe the scene with uh, Marlene talking to her dad about, uh, uh, uh. then you see his, her dad dead in the surgical room. Then we cut to the actual beginning with Ellie uh, and we play all the way through Ellie up to that point. And then you kind of get that punch in the stomach when Abby and Owen are talking at the lodge and you go, oh, oh shit. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think introducing uh, that section of her backstory earlier would have made the story um, more fluid and maybe more acceptable. Well, th that's why, again, I, and I don't know, maybe, and this is not one of the things where just because it's my idea, I'm going to push it, you know, to the moon and not let anybody tell me any differently, but... Oh, well, I feel attacked now. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, where I'm, like, what I said about my DLC idea, when you do mm -hmm. DLC, it's after the fact. It's, yeah. it's after when you play the game, okay, the game is, a, that's the game, that's the main game, there's no more surprises. But oh, DLC to me, it's almost like okay. Well, what if what if we we experiment? We play around with the players' feelings a little bit, um, and it's like, well, if you don't want to play as Abby because she killed Joel, then don't get the DLC. That's that's up to you. But yeah. if you want an alternative perspective, we have twelve hours of gameplay that might change your mind or might make you look at things a bit differently. So that's why yeah. I feel like the DLC is probably the safest zone that you could put that whole thing into without because again like we talked about if you put it within the first hour the player is going to be like okay i thought this was last of us why am i playing at this as this character if you put it later on everybody's going to be like well she just killed joel why do i care about this character so i feel like when you let ellie get her revenge and abby eventually dies or whatever after the fact when you'd be like okay you played the game now you know what happens but what if we give you some backstory and, and allow for you to, you know, if, if you want to be set in your ways, that's fine. But if you want to be a little bit open-minded about how somebody else is perceiving the situation, go ahead and get this DLC. Yeah, and, well, I, and I, I think that that would have been a, an interesting way to approach this because of the fact that I think the Ellie chunk of the game uh, is, about the, is about the duration of the original game. Yeah. And so, but but Left Behind was a short game. It was, I mean, yeah. it wasn't like an hour, but it was short by comparison. Yeah. And so if we had, if, if it had been premeditated to follow Ellie's entire story in the first portion, or in the, in the actual Last of Us game, 
even if that even if that expounded into the stuff that we see with the rattlers, that would have been fine. Yeah. And then I agree with you. I think it would have been just as, or I think it would have been more effective to take that entire twelve-hour chunk and essentially introduce it as a second thing, or have it be like if I because if I'm paying sixty bucks for all of this content anyway, which I think was kind of their thing. Let me play through the game and then unlock the Abbey portion. Yeah. And then I can play through that. Ooh, look. Um, I, I want to bring this up and we may, real quick and then we might talk about it later because I don't want to dwell too much on it. But um, I, the thought occurred to me, as far as actual DLC, even though you said it doesn't sound like Neil is going to release any. What do you think about the idea of a DLC with Yara and Lev and seeing what happened prior to us meeting them? Like, playing through that. that I think that would be an interesting little story to follow. Yeah. In a, in a, in a left-behind kind of setting. Yeah, I wouldn't mind that. that uh, any backstory to the characters, I think, especially when Naughty Dog is doing it, like, it, it's interesting. But only if it's within context and if it's within the right time. You know, because uh, DLC, again, it's optional. Okay, you, you, you don't care about Lev, you don't care you care about Yara, okay, don't get the DLC. But when it's a part of the actual game, it's like, well, I, I kind of want to get my money's worth, so give me something. So, uh, I want to get to the actual story itself. Because, based off of everything that I've seen, everything that I've read, I'm... Fair to say that everybody is split. 50-50 where you have some people saying, oh, I don't know what people are talking about, this game is great. But then you have some people going, no, this, this, for a Last of Us sequel, this, this didn't do what it needed to do. Um, the, the story I'm not going to go through like exactly verbatim and timeline of what happens. If you guys want to know, you can uh, YouTube it or, or search it and it'll, it'll come up. Chances are, if you're a Last of Us fan, you already know by now because you've played the game. But... I just, I felt like the story didn't connect. I feel like there were so many loopholes. And let me just emphasize by saying, because I, I, I'm not saying that you said this or you, you insinuated it. Joel dying was okay for me. It's fine. I'm not, I'm not, because I know that there's a handful of people where the second they saw that Joel death scene, I saw one guy literally cut up the disc. Um... And I didn't have that reaction when I saw the Joel death scene. My instant reaction wasn't, "Oh well, I'm gonna. That's it. There's no point in me playing the game anymore. Let's turn it off." Yeah, I know. Like Pewdie, PewDiePie got real bent out of shape about it. Apparently. Yeah, I, I came across that video. I never actually clicked on it, but I, I might afterwards. Um, Joel passing away. I mean, I got teary eyed. I got emotional. I had my hands on my head. Uh, full nine yards. I definitely had a reaction. But my reaction wasn't, okay, let's turn off the game because the story went in a direction that I didn't want it to go. It's just, my whole thing was, if you're going to take a beloved character away, you, there needs to be a payoff. There needs to be some type of payoff. And I'm not, I'm not asking for a fairy tale ending. Because if I was asking for a fairy tale ending, I would be like, Joel and Ellie get out of the second game unscathed. They're both alive and they go, you know, live their lives. Yeah, uh, I, th I think I think Joel's death in within this game is is fine as a plot point. Yeah, it's fine. But what what baffles me, and, and and I I know that you've said this, and I know other people have said it. Essentially, Ellie is breaking that cycle where the more you kill, the more this is gonna happen. Um. And so what didn't make sense to me was the fact that they took the time after the, the part where Dina and JJ and Ellie are in the, are in the little ranch house or, or in their home. And then all of a sudden Ellie, because she's got PTSD and whatever, she makes, she makes the decision of, I'm going to finish this. So you're like, okay, here we go. This is what I've been waiting for. Only I, want, I, want, I want to chime in for one second real quick about that point. Yeah. Uh, that's an oversimplification of what happens in that, in that section. <laughs> because you've got Tommy guilt-tripping her like a, like a dick. Uh, her struggling with the PTSD, 
so it becoming a little self-serving, but also her feeling like she failed Joel. Yeah, um, Tommy was definitely an influence on the side, but I, I truly feel like that part is ingrained in Ellie, that if you do me wrong, if you take away the ones that I love, I'm going to come after you. I just feel like that's something that Joel indirectly sort of passed on to her, that you don't trust anybody, someone tries to wrong you, you deal with it. Um, and, and definitely throughout the story, you, you, you could see the emotion. And somebody else brought that up where whatever Abby does in those 12 hours of gameplay, there's no emotion. She does things and she's like, okay, moving on. And you could see, there's that one part where um, Ellie tortures um, Nora and when she comes home, uh, or well, not comes home, but when she goes to the theater and uh, Dina and Jesse are there, and you could see... Yeah, she, she's visibly affected by it as opposed to Abby and her sociopathic nature. <laughs> yeah, the, the part where Ellie goes, she opens up the map, she goes, they're over here. And Dina's like, well, okay, Ellie, all right, just... All right, settle down. Um, you, you, you could tell that, that, there, that there's that, 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 that emotional part of her. And that's why I'm so confused as how Naughty Dog is almost indirectly trying to get you to be like, oh, well, you need to feel sympathetic for Abby, even though she goes through the world doing what she does without blinking an eye. And that, that's why in my mind that didn't compute. It's like, and, and, and there are so many subtle things that they did when you play as Abby, for example the petting of the dog. And when you get paired with Lev, it's almost like, oh, here's the new Joel and Ellie, you know? So in my mind, it was, don't do that, Naughty Dog. Don't, don't try to, to manipulate the game in a way where you want us to feel a certain way because I know that Neil's philosophy is, well, what do you think? You know, if you ever ask a question of, what is this supposed to be? His famous answer is, what do you think? You know, almost throwing it in your hands and going, it's, it's whatever you want it to be. There is no definite yes or no. But what I, what, what I was trying to get at is, so Ellie sort of takes on a part two and goes, okay, let's, let's tackle this. Let's, let's end this once and for all. So we get to the infamous moment where she's drowning Abby. She has this quick flashback to, to thinking about Joel on that porch. And then all of a sudden she lets Abby go and goes, just go. Grab, grab him and, and go. And literally by the end of the game, Abby, uh, not Abby, Ellie loses everything. And yeah. again... Which I, know, I, I talked about just repeatedly to you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I understand that. Again, you, you, in games like this, you can't have the fairy tale ending. Um, where everything is okay and everything snaps into place and the characters can walk away the same way that they walked in, you know, before the, the events of the second game, you know, took, took place. And I understand that. But it just seems like Ellie became the one that lost everything, even though you're cheering for her the whole time. Um, and in my mind, it was, you couldn't throw her a bone. You, like... You couldn't, I mean, I don't know, uh, now that I think about it, I'm like, okay, all right, like, if that's the decision that you feel like you wholeheartedly wanted to go with, but it just, it doesn't make sense to me. Like, why couldn't we just end the story where it's JJ, it's Dina, and it's Ellie, you know, and they're, and uh, Ellie is, you know, uh, getting the sheep inside, you know, the barn, um, and then you kind of have it, like, fade out from there, um. I, I don't know. What do you think? What's, what's, what's your perspective? Well, I mean, my, the, the game definitely didn't conform to my ideal ending. Um, I mean, obviously I am, I, I look at a lot of things from a story perspective, which is why I don't have, I, like I said, I don't have a problem with the fact that, that Joel got offed during this one because it lent itself to the story of the revenge and Ellie seeking out Abby and all that. Did I need a perfect ending where everybody's fine? Like, honestly, I was fine. I was fine with Tommy being dead until they showed him again. Um, and even he was he, like, 
I'm going to be a little bit of a, bit of a dick right now about Tommy. Um, I, I literally like grabbed my face home alone, home alone style. When I saw Tommy, I'm like, Oh shit, he survived. And then when he started being an asshole, I was like, I kind of wish you'd stay dead. <laughs> Uh, I like I didn't even need Tommy to survive if all of them had died, and I know like the it, it, the the going from Abby saying I don't want to see you again to the to the happy ending wouldn't have worked for me either. I would have felt like it was kind of a slap in the face a little bit, but I would have also understood Ellie's character, and I probably would have accepted it kind of the same way I accepted the way it does end. But I would have almost preferred what I sent you. Uh, if you guys haven't looked it up, there's a video online which just it slightly recuts the ending, and it's absolutely not perfect because it's using what's available in game. Yeah, uh, I'll spoil it a little bit. Uh, the person playing through it uh, screws up the Abby. Uh, stalking Ellie thing on purpose. Ellie chops her with a with a almost a katana with a machete, <laughs> and uh, then you see the ending play out with the farmhouse and the final scene with Joel. Perfectly fine ending. Uh, a little choppy, but perfectly fine. That's more on point with what I would have liked to have seen from this game for Ellie, but. Even if you'd done the Abby, I never want to see you again, and then Ellie goes and she lives on the farm, and you see the, the I, I don't know, no, nothing really fits quite right. But I would have liked to have seen Ellie end up on the farm with Dina and just let her live her life. Yeah. Because that's what Ellie deserved at this point. Because I, I as a fan, and as, uh, here's, here's the other thing I'm going to put into perspective. For Ellie and for Joel, uh, the reason they're more to us than just Ellie and Joel is because we are Ellie and Joel. <laughs> How so? We played, we played their lives. So we're, that, that's why we're so deeply ingrained in them and their psyche and so invested is because they're kind of us at this point. Yeah. And so it hurts <laughs> to see Ellie... Who and, and and maybe it boils down more to this because we played as Joel the entire game and the whole objective was to save our surrogate daughter. She is our surrogate daughter. Yeah. And and to then have this game where our where at, at, by the end of the game we're Joel up in heaven looking down going, oh Ellie, or oh ba- ba- baby girl, I feel so bad for you. Um, it sucks. I just want I just want my daughter to be happy, and that's why I would have liked t- for uh, her to just get to live out her life on that farm with Dina. And then shit, if we have a part three and it follows Abby and Lev, whatever, that's fine. But uh, that's the stuff I would have liked to have landed at in a different way. Yeah, I just. With everything said and done, I just feel like this story is not it, it. It wasn't Last of Us. It was something else. Yeah. Which, which I've said to you, I said the story is great, but not a great Last of Us story. Yeah, and I don't know if you would be a fan of this, but you know, if if we can all press the reset button for a second mentally. In my mind, I was thinking, I think what would be, and this is just me spitballing, but I thought about this yesterday and I said, you know, I think that what would have been an interesting story is if when the second game picks up, you, they make it obvious that Joel and Ellie have had some distance because Ellie, you know, has sort of figured out that, okay, Joel was most likely BSing me when he said, you know, there is no cure. Um, yeah, she always had that sneaking suspicion. Yeah, and I would have been more inclined to see a story where maybe Ellie has become distant and then hears that maybe Joel has run into some trouble and, you know, that's, you know, it's like, it's it's like, it's it's that philosophy of, you know, if I say something to you or if I hurt you, that's one thing, but if anybody else hurts you, they're dead. Um, 
And I always feel like Joel and Ellie sort of had that relationship where we're going to say a lot of things to each other, uh, you know, but at the end of the day, if anybody dares to harm a hair on your head, I'm having none of it. So I, I would have been more inclined to see that story of, and I know Neil the whole time he was saying the first story focused on love and the second one focused on hate. Um, and I think that that to some extent would, would, it, it wouldn't fulfill that completely, but to some extent it's like Ellie could have that, have that, that hate inside of her. Like how dare he lie to me? How dare he risk humanity? But the second, when the person whom you're mad at is in trouble where does your loyalty lie, you know? Um, yeah. So, and uh, again, if you wanted to kill Joel off, like, that would be okay, as long as it's justified, if it's right, when it's right. Um, th- th- like, it's, 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 the whole thing is just, it's so blank, you know? It's like, really? This is, this is what all the hype and all the anticipation was about, so... I mean, I don't know. Have you ever spitballed about that? Like, since the, since you completed the game, have you ever thought about, you know, if I could maybe press that reset button and take the story elsewhere or focus on something completely different, what would that be? Have you ever thought of that? Or has it been just, you know, the second game, it is what it is at this point? Um, I mean, I, I think that as somebody who does screenwriting and has been sort of a creative-minded individual for, for the majority of my life. Like, I used to write stupid-ass stories in, in middle school yeah. um, that would absolutely not fly as, like, a video game or a movie concept. But that's not the point, yeah. Sean. That's not the point. Um, <laughs> the But, no, I, th- I, I absolutely... Like, even movies that I watch, uh, for example, the, the, uh, the last, I'm not going to go too far in, down this path, but The Last Jedi, the, the eighth Star Wars movie. Yeah. I don't like that movie at all. I'm one of the people who does not like The Last Jedi because I felt like it was a betrayal of the form, a betrayal of the characters, and I think Ryan Johnson, God bless him, he hasn't, he hasn't done, like, not all of his movies suck, but that one did. Yeah. Um. I absolutely would have written that movie differently. Rise of Skywalker, based on what it was, I don't have a huge problem with. Um, because it retconned a lot of the shit that I didn't like from the movie before it. So in a situation like this, I absolutely am sitting there playing it going, Ugh, I would have done that different. I wouldn't have done this. Blah, blah. And, and uh, just based on our conversations, a lot of it, I think is just story order. Like, I think that the way that they cut the game together is the big issue because I don't, I don't have a problem with the, I don't have an overarching plot problem with this game, but yeah, if you change the order of a couple of things, like you mentioned again, and I backpedaled on that. I wouldn't want to play as Abby for for an, an entire hour of the beginning of the game, but I play, I play it, play as her for 20, 30 minutes. That's fine. Because that, then, like I said, it kind of builds that, uh, curiosity. You're like, who the hell's this? Yeah. Why am I interested in her? And then you jump back to Ellie. You're like, well, wait, who was I just playing as? And then when you see her going, uh, with, with Owen up the hill and they're like, they're, they're talking about hunting whoever it is down. And you're like, oh, they're outside of Jack's and they're coming for Joel. Now you feel more invested in this. You're like, you, you better fucking not. And yeah. then she, and then she does. Um, it's it's one of those those things where small changes could probably have made this story land a lot better for people like you, for PewDiePie, even to a degree for me. Um, because I think the way that it is does kind of betray the fans. Um, and the big, the big reason is you got a 12 hour gap in the middle where you don't even touch on your, we don't see Ellie. We don't see Ellie at any point during that 12 hours. Yeah. I'm going to sort of get into for just two minutes. I'm going to get into a small little lecture about marketing and advertising 
the the one thing that I considered it was kind of like a really moment was you know you look at the for example specifically for you and I you look at the collector's edition you look at the Ellie edition everything on around and just on that box refers to Ellie whether it's the tattoo yeah. the guitar the the face whatever it is and I just want to chime in and say I think that's why I don't have a, have any qualms with having spent the amount of money I did is because I still love Ellie. Yeah, I I, I do as well. It's just uh, what went you know with all the teaser trailers, with all the state of plays, with everything, they lead you to believe that this is Ellie's story, that this is yeah. the, the the road to redemption. And when you start playing the game, when I got to that, that theater scene where Abby has Ellie at gunpoint, I'm thinking, okay, the ending is just, it's five minutes away. Because the, the game was, was already sort of long at that point. And yeah, it's like... That, that's one of those things where I was cautioned. <laughs> I, I know I ca cautioned Jordan, and I don't know if I said it to you, but I, I definitely mentioned to a couple of people, you're going to hit a false ending, and then you're still going to have a while to go. So don't get, don't get too, <laughs> too invested. Yeah, and so I just, I feel like when you market something the way that they did... I mean, Abby was almost tucked away the whole time. And I'm not saying yeah. for them to come out and go, yeah, you're going to play as Abby and she's going to have a significant role and she's going to be responsible. Like, no, I'm not, I'm not saying do that. But don't market it as, oh, this is just Ellie's story. And th the one thing that I sort of consider to be a low blow from Naughty Dog to their fans is how they actually took the time to fake a few of the cutscenes. So, for example, I think I brought it up to you when I said, you know, in the reveal trailer back in September, when the game was supposed to come out in February, mind you, they had a, that moment, the very last clip where Joel goes, you think I'd let you do this on your own. I, and, I was going to bring this up, where, where somebody grabs her from behind and covers her mouth, and I'll let you continue. Go ahead. Yeah, and, and he says that line... And so, immediately, they're, they're sort of drawing you in as, oh, okay, so Joel is going to have a role in this thing as well. And then when you start playing the actual game, um, you know, then you see that it's actually Jesse who says that line. And in my mind, it was really Naughty Dog. Because here's the thing. If they tell you that something is not in the game, and then it is, I, I can accept that. Because you, you you're, kind, kind of like with playing as Ellie from the first one, where they said you're not going to play as Ellie, and then you play as her during that entire winter section. Yeah, because at that point you're not taking anything away from me. But when you falsely advertise it as yeah, Joel is going to be in this part of the game, and he's not, and it's actually somebody else's line, and it's a completely different actor. It's it, it's deceptive. Exactly. And not in a way of like, oh, well, they're trying to get you to not guess the plot. No, what they're, they're lying to you, essentially. You know, you're, yeah. you're convincing me that something is in the game when it's not. It's the complete opposite of what we just talked about 20 seconds ago. So, and and, you, and I, you and I had talked about this, is the idea during all of these teasers, oh, well, maybe if Joel dies, then he's a figment of her imagination throughout the game. Yeah. I would have been okay with that. Yeah. Like if if we had seen a couple of scenes, because you see those little those little flashes of uh, like when she's what is it? It's right before she gets in the boat. She sees Joel with his head caved in. Yeah. Which I don't I I don't I don't suggest going back and pausing because it's graphic. But you have that, and uh, the the thing with that is that if. If we'd had had it played as more of moments of he's actually a figment of her imagination and her psyche going, hey, baby, baby girl, you really gonna do this on your own or whatever that whatever she whatever he says in the very 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 first teaser we got where she says I'm gonna kill every last one of them. Yeah. Which consequently, I I don't fault them for not including that scene. I kind of wish they had because that would have been one of those really sweet. Sweet being a uh, flexible term. One of those really cool moments to see. Because then you'd be like, oh, she just killed a bunch of guys and now there's a guitar. Like, I was prepared for that scene where maybe she goes through a place, through a house, 
kills all the people and there's a guitar in the corner and so she sits down to just kind of calm her mind at that point and she plays something on the guitar and then that's when she either has the hallucination or Joel walks in whatever was going to play I was prepared for that scene and that didn't happen at all <laughs> yeah you know I sort of think about it now I think that if you had a moment where if it, if it is a figment of like Ellie's imagination of like, oh, what would, if Joel was here, what would he tell me? And sort yeah, of like... It would, been, it would have been a great character moment. Yeah, be, be, because you would have sort of foreshadowed like Joel sort of talking to Ellie and going, baby girl, it's not worth it. Stop. And I think that would and have... That, yeah, that would ahead. have made the ending resound a lot more heavily because then he, he gave her that speech early on and now she's like right there at the cusp of killing her, and then she backs off because of what Joel said to her. That would have been a lot, a lot uh, nicer of a moment. I, I think that's where you were going, right? Yeah, like almost like that moment where you know, again, I'm not a fan of this, but if that scene was implemented in there, and when Ellie is drowning Abby, she sort of has a flashback to a moment where she was hallucinating, where right before when Abby's about to you know drown. Ellie sort of recalls Joel, um, Joel asking her, you really going to go through with this? Sort of insinuating to her like, okay, well, if you go through with it, I'm not coming back. It's it's not going to do anything for you. So I don't know. Like, again, that that's just that that's spitballing. But I think there were subtle things that they could have done to make the plot sort of resonate a little bit better. I just think that the focus of the game was taken away. Um so, so yeah, like, going back to the whole marketing and whatever, it's like, they were very, very deceptive. And I'm not in a good way where it's like, oh, keep, keep in mind, I, I forgot about this for a complete day. You and I were convinced, the whole world was convinced that Dina was the one who was going to die in this whole thing. And it's like, man, were we wrong? You know, because I, I even one time subtly made a, um, a prediction that, you know, what if it's Tommy that they have tied up and she's like, please stop, um, you know, insinuating that Joel has already died and Tommy is sort of like the last, you know, thing of Joel that's left for her. Yeah. yeah. So th I, I kind of called it. I'm like, maybe it's Tommy that they're actually killing. But no, inevitably, it was the man himself. It was Joel. So, um. Yeah, uh, uh, I don't know. I just, personally, the story didn't hit home for me. Uh, I was I was asking more questions than I had answers. Um, it, I literally, a little after Joel's death, in my mind, the only thing that I could think of was The Last of Us should have just been kept as a standalone game. Yeah. You know, I like I very early sort of it, it sort of it fell through for me where I was like, I'm, I'm not feeling this. This is not I, I don't I don't see it. I don't feel it. So. Um, anything else, Dan, that you want to throw in there? Any final comments or sentiments or something that maybe we haven't even covered yet? Because I know it's a lot, like, talking about pacing and story and delivery and all that. I don't know. We might have completely forgotten about something. Well, I, I know we didn't we didn't delve into the story. So if I can, I'm going to try and summarize it real quick. Yeah. And, and just kind of leave the floor open for any other thoughts you might have. Okay. So, so a final spoiler alert to everybody who's watching. Uh, we've hinted at things, but I'm about to kind of summarize the plot as best I can. So, you have Ellie and, and Joel and everybody, and they're living real happily. And then you've got Abby and her crew. They show up in Jackson because Abby's dad was killed by Joel. They kill Joel. That sets everything else into motion. Ellie goes to Seattle and starts picking each of them off. And then... Uh, we get to the point where Abby comes back, discovers this, and finds her due to one of the most frustrating <laughs> mistakes in my mind, uh, because Ellie leaves her map. So they track her back to the theater, hold her at gunpoint, and then we spend 12 hours getting backstory on Abby. Okay, whatever. And we catch back up to the theater, 
and they fight. Uh, Abby beats her. Ellie goes to try and live her life. Tommy says, hey, you made a promise to me and to Joel that you were going to get revenge. Ellie goes, ah, well, shit, I guess. So she goes to Santa Barbara and tries to track down Abby to kill her, but then she sees her, a broken, damaged shell of herself. Can't bring herself to do it until she can. So they fight. And uh, Ellie is inches from drowning her after losing two of her fingers. And... Uh, lets her go. She lets Abby go. And Abby and Lev, uh, who I didn't talk about at all in this summary, <laughs> sail off to do whatever the hell they do while Ellie goes back to the farm and everybody's gone. So she has nothing left. She can't play guitar. She doesn't have her wife or her kid. <laughs> wife. Mm-hmm. Uh, wife or kid. Uh, Tommy isn't going to accept her anymore and Joel's dead. Um, the, the big thing I took away from this whole thing is that they turned Ellie into the, in, into the perfect tragic hero. She's literally the saddest character <laughs> I have ever encountered in anything because they robbed her of everything she could have had. There's, she didn't walk away from this game with anything except her life. Yeah. And that broke my heart. I, I, I told you this. I, I'm going to open up to our audience a little bit. I played my third day of playing. I played until 530. The sun was coming up outside of my apartment. And I, I didn't have anybody. Of, I, I, I was the first person in my social group to finish the game. So I didn't have anybody in my group I could text. It was also early in the morning. The, the person living in my same residence was asleep. There was nobody I could talk to about what I had just experienced. Yes. And I was broken. <laughs> and so I had to hold that burden for a couple of hours until somebody was available. And when I started talking to that person, I could not. I, I was struggling through a, a knot in my throat and, and uh, tears to even articulate how I felt about the end of that game. Because we've talked about this more or less throughout this episode. The fact that I love the character of Ellie. And I think it's because, like I said, she's essentially, uh, she's as much our, our daughter as she is Joel's yeah. at this point. And if you just project yourself into that situation, you, you think of yourself as, as a father or a mother or whatever. And then you're watching the story of your child play out, and you can't affect it. <laughs> and you just get to watch them lose everything. It's going to break your heart, which is exactly what happened. And so I'm, I'm sitting there at 7 o'clock in the morning, having not slept, going, I just can't wrap my head around it. I'm so sad for Ellie. Like, I was sympathetic for, for, a, for a fictional character. Yeah. Because, she, uh, I, and I don't want to, I don't want to shit on Naughty Dog for it, but she deserved so much better than what she got. Like as a person, she, Ellie deserved better, and it, it it hurts. It's it's a very painful game to play, which I was also prepared for, because I'd seen the I'd seen the the reviews leading up to the release that said it's a very 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 bleak game and I went okay great this game's gonna gonna hurt me so much emotionally and yet I played it and I was able to find I've talked about the fact that I find enjoyment I can find enjoyment out of things other people don't like yeah so I found enjoyment out of the stuff that you and PewDiePie and other people that I've spoken to weren't crazy about. Because the game's not a bad game, it's just, again, boiling it down, not a great Last of Us sequel. But uh, that's the summary of the game, and I know I've talked this entire time and kind of not let you in, but do you have any final thoughts on that entire plot? Um, just the fact that, for, and this is just me personally, I don't know, much like you, Dan, or some some of, some of our listeners, or just people out there, they might they they feel differently. 
But personally, to me, being a, a, a Last of Us fan, and I've told you, I've told everybody before, I've been very open about this. Last of Us, first one, you know, is my favorite game in the whole world. Um, you can specifically attest to this. My um, iPhone menu picture is a collage of Ellie. Um, I have two Last of Us, original Last of Us posters that are supposed to come in. Um, that are supposed to be delivered. So, much like you, Ellie is one of those characters that you just you fall in love with. And you always hope that, in, no matter how much of a mess that she's in, that she finds happiness somewhere. Or there is something that, 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 that can make her go to sleep at night knowing that, hey, I still have this. Um, and the fact that that last, the, the very last image before it goes to the credits, I think exemplifies everything. The fact that you, you know, you see that guitar on the left of the screen, right, you know, on the other side of the window. And, uh, and on the outside of the window, you see Ellie walking away into essentially oblivion. We don't know where she's going. We don't know what her plans are. And there's almost that part of it that's like, well, she's basically hit rock bottom. I hope that, uh, much like how Joel said in the first game, I hope that she finds something to fight for. Um, yeah, I just, I'm sorry to say, but the game didn't deliver personally for me. I, at this specific point in time, I don't see myself really ever playing the game. Um, not, 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 not in the very distant future, at least who knows, maybe a year or two years from now, I might be like, you know what, let's give this, you know, a, a one more over. But as of right now, I just feel like, Okay, all right, after all the hype, after all the anticipation, I thought that they had this, you know, where it needed to be, and in my personal opinion, they didn't. So, I don't know. I don't know where we go from here. Is there a Last of Us Part 3? Are we forever done with The Last of Us? Is that the, the closing image of, you know, is that going to be, is that going to live in immortality as the last image of The Last of Us? I don't know, but personally to me, this game didn't deliver, uh, it was more of a drag, it was more of a task than anything, just because it was so long and it just, it felt like never ending, um, yeah. so, well, let's, real quick, before we sign off, let's, uh, let's delve into that a little bit, where do you think this goes, I know I've thrown a couple things out to you, because you've got the TV show in development over, over there at HBO, and you have the unknown variable of whether or not there's going to be a part three. What do you think, or what do you, you personally, reflecting on what you've just experienced, what do you think their end game was? What, or what do, you, what do you think they're going to do? Or what would you do? Honestly, at this point in time, and I don't know, maybe my answer might change if you ask me sometime down, like, you know, no. down the road. No, obviously, I, I, want you to, I want you to treat this whole question knowing that there's a show in development. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I would honestly, <laughs> I mean, I want to say that I would just leave it alone because, uh, you know, before the, the release of the second one, it was almost like that philosophy of, of if it ain't broke, don't, you know, don't try to fix it. Um, if there is a TV show coming out, I think the, the least that you could do is give us some insight on where this, this took Ellie. What is she embarking on now? Is she going to try to press the reset button and try to start a new life? Is she got? Is she gonna try to pick up the breadcrumbs of what she has left with Dina and JJ and Tommy? Um, because quite honestly, I don't want to see another backstory of Abby and Lev and how Abby's feeling and you know what's going on in that in that brain of hers. I really don't care. Um, it, it's such an inconvenience the way that they placed everything. I know, I know what they were going for. They were trying to get you to empathize and sympathize with Abby. 
But it's not going to work when you have her kill a character that you have loved for seven years. Um, yeah. But that, that's just, that's, 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 that's what I, that's where I am right now is leave it alone. And if you absolutely have to do the TV show, give me at least some insight as to where Ellie is right now. What unfolded afterwards? Um, hopefully there's a light at the end of the tunnel for her. Um but that that's 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 what I would do if 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 the dec- the decision was up to me. But what would you do? Well, for me, like the 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 concept that you kind of brought up of following Ellie from this point forward is not it's not a bad idea because while you what while while you could go back and set the show essentially from the beginning to introduce. Which I'm not. I'm not gonna lie. I was a little thrown off by the announcement that there was a last of a show in development. I'm like, there's been one game. What are you guys doing? Yeah. But there's the obvious thing where you can in, you can just start in season one, and hell, that might even be what they do. I I don't know with the reaction of this one that they would want to follow through with introducing the whole Abby storyline within the show. But you could essentially uh, recreate the first game for season one, whatever. it'll, It'll stretch. I think that's the nice thing about a game that's still 15 hours long is you can, you can make an entire season, a TV show out of it. Yeah. Um, especially on HBO, given the fact that game of Thrones got shortened from 10, 10 episodes to eight or whatever the hell it was in that last season. Um, so, shit, eight, eight episodes, whatever. So, you could start the show recapping the first game. And maybe we play it by ear as to whether or not we even go into Last of Us 2. And then you can uh, follow the plot of Ellie afterwards. And maybe that's what they were building toward. Is Then, like, break it down this way. At this point, you've got two two paths to follow. The show follows Ellie and her interactions afterward, because now she's on a blank slate. She's a 19, year, 19 20 year old uh, girl who has nothing going for her in a zombie apocalypse. So, how where where does she fall in the world? What does she do from this point? She also doesn't have fingers. Um, and she, the alternative is that if you go to Last of Us Part Three, which I know people won't. Like, you can follow Abby and Lev for that because they've got a they've got their own story. Yeah. I wouldn't want to watch an HBO show based on Abby and Lev, um, but a standalone game about them at this point, <laughs> I don't have a huge problem with if it's a compelling story. Yeah. Now, obviously, here's where you run into the problem is The Last of Us isn't The Last of Us without Ellie or Joel. Yeah. So who's alive? Ellie. So we have to find a way to weave Ellie back into Abby and Lev's story after she let them go, if we're going to do a third game. I have zero interest in a game that follows exclusively Abby and Lev. Yeah. (laughs) So I think that's the corner that Naughty Dog backed themselves into with this one. Uh, I hope the show is all about Ellie. I don't care about Abby, not a, not in that, not to that degree. If you if you now change the title, <laughs> I don't know what the hell you would make it. If it was like yeah, a few of us, <laughs> and you you made it about Abby and Lev. Uh, okay, whatever. Give them their own series. It's fine. They're compelling it. That's the thing. And I know you don't necessarily agree. They're compelling enough characters on their own where if they didn't hijack this game, I would be invested in them. I would care about them. I I liked Abby's backstory. I hated what she did and where it took her. Yeah. And I painted that... Sorry, I haven't touched on this at all during this episode. I touched on that with you. Abby and Ellie, literally, if you, uh, for lack of a better analogy, they're a palindrome of each other. 
because if you follow Ellie forward, you'll meet Abby in the middle and go the opposite direction. Then from Abby's perspective, if, if you flip the thing, she is Ellie, and then Ellie is Abby. Yeah. So it, it that I'm sure that's the thing that they were trying to stick, and they did okay. They did okay on that. Um, but again, it boils down to uh, I don't even I don't even remember, remember the article I read. But it it is a uh, or the post I read. It's the writer has an an obligation to the audience to. Oh, I can't remember what it is. Basically, Naughty Dog had an obligation to the fans to give them what they want. Yeah. And I feel like most of us wanted to see Ellie wrap up her story and be happy because she'd already gone she'd already gone through a shitty story in the first one. Yeah. And and she didn't have anything else going for her but Joel. And Joel just lied to her at the end of the first game. And in this one, she falls in love with Dina, and having played the game, she ha- they have a kid. And you're like, oh shit, that's a nice little life out, out on a farm with your wife and your kid. Let her have that. And they didn't do it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> one key word that I think in situations like Last of Us that needs to be thought of and deliberated on is overexposure. <laughs> I've always believed that something always works, no matter what it is. It could be a standalone movie, a standalone video game, a standalone song, a standalone artist, or or whatever it is. If it works, it works. Awesome. But you will find that throughout history, a lot of the times that those standalone things often suffer because of overexposure. You know, and that's not to say that, you know... it. That if something has a sequel or if something has a second coming, um, that it's that it's always going to fail. So never, ever go for it. But I just feel like it's one of those things where sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And in my personal opinion, I feel like that's what happened here. Is while we all clamored for it, while we all almost asked for it. We got it, but it wasn't what we were expecting, or really even wanted for that matter. Um, and could things have been done differently, and maybe it would have been a bit more salvageable? Probably. But I think you said it best, is that when you think of Last of Us, you, you think of Joel and Ellie. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna run through a few games here, and uh, like I just I want everybody to, to to sort of to understand where I'm coming from. It's almost like having a Tony Hawk Pro Skater game without Tony Hawk. It's almost like having like if you were to have one of the main Uncharted games, but you didn't have Nathan Drake. It's almost like having a, a game, but the, the character who the, or the character or characters who made the game or the series become absent, you know? And it's like, if you build a foundation around those characters, you need to honor the series with those characters. And again, that's not to say that, you know, Last of Us 2 should have just been Joel and Ellie. And after when Joel dies, it's only Ellie. That, that's, that's all that, that you give exposure to. No, because then that's going to get stale very quick. But when you have 12 hours of gameplay dedicated to a, a character whom everybody already despises. I just don't understand how in their minds they thought, oh, people are, they're going to tune into this. They're going to catch on to this. Um, and not once, not once did I empathize with Abby. Not once. At all. I don't, like, whether it was in the aquarium, whether it was an intimate moment with Owen, whether it was with the dog, whether it was, you know, her pregnant friend, who got killed? I didn't empathize at all. <laughs> you don't even you don't even mention her, eh? Right? No, because I, I don't. I, what was what, Mel? Was that her name? It was Mel. Yeah. Yeah. See, th- <laughs> and I don't know. I think that's another problem too. Is that there were so many new characters introduced in this one, um, 
in the second one there was, or I'm sorry, in the first one there was as well, but it was it was limited, it was sporadic, and it was stretched out. Like for example, first half of the game you have Tess, in the middle of the game you have Sam and Henry, towards the end of the game you have Tommy, David, and uh, give or take Marlene. But I feel like with this one, it was, okay, we got Dina, and then we got um, Jesse, and then we got, from Abby's side, we got Owen, and then we got Mel, and then we get Lev, and then we get Yara, and it's like this, this, it's like new character, new character, new character, new character, and the problem is when you start introducing all these new characters, you need to give them some backstory, because they're just fillers, essentially, at that point. Um... And I think that's where the game kind of suffers. Like, and I think that's the one thing that the Uncharted series always did very well is bringing in old characters while introducing new characters, but not at a point where you lose track and you go, wait, what's this person's name? Wait, who was that again? And I think I told you there was a, there were a few moments when I, when I was playing the game where I'm like, Wait a second. What's the objective here again? Where are we trying to go? What are we trying to do? Um, <laughs> like literally, because I think there was also a moment where you had a flashback within a flashback, and that's where I was like, okay, this is this is too much. I'm sorry, but it's becoming hard to follow. I'm losing sight of what I'm supposed to be doing. All I know is I know that who I'm not gonna be cheering for, and I'm just I'm waiting to re reach the end uh, of the game. It was at a point where I'm like, oh, can it be over already? Like, can we just wrap this up? Because it, it, it's so much. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm tirating and I'm rambling on here, but um, everything that they could have done incorrectly in my mind, and this is just me personally talking, everything that they could have done, that they could have done incorrectly, they did. You know, my philosophy before release was... I can trust Naughty Dog. I'm not going to say that all of the trust is gone, but most of that trust is is sort of like you're 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 wary. Yeah. You're a little uneasy at this point. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and 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 again, it's cir it's circumstantial. If this had been its own game, and I mean if you'd renamed Ellie and Joel in this game as like uh, Tiffany and and Bill not Bill. Bill exists already. Bob. If they were Tiffany and Bob in this game, <laughs> it would have been a perfectly fine game. Yeah. But for them to be characters, we, we've, again, to, it's almost cliche for us at this point to say that we've loved for seven years and have them uh, go down the path that we watched them go down. It, it sucks. It does. Yeah. Yeah, which which is why I think, especially with the ending that we got to the first game, it, it's so solid because I, I've told you before, it's not so good, it's not so bad, it's just, it's somewhere in between where the audience has to choose what did the characters do once that screen faded to black. Yeah, um, that's part of why we love the first one, is that you don't know exactly, and I, I don't want to say this game shouldn't have been made. I don't want to say that this game shouldn't have been made because I, I think it again. I, I I'm beating this horse. It's a fine story. Um, I admire them for what they did and what they committed to. However, the, the story of the, the Last of Us, the first one, is such a perfect little contained story. That if this is the sequel we we got, we don't need it. Yeah. Um, because getting to that last moment of swear to me, swear to me that everything you said to me about the fireflies is true. I swear. Okay. And that's it. That's all that we get. That was a beautiful ending. I think that's why that game resonated so well with people is does she believe him or does it does she not? And and what does it matter in the grand scheme of things? And then in this one we see why it matters. 
she kind of questions him for five years until I, I don't remember the exact timeline as to when she went back to Salt Lake City. Yeah. But she goes back, she learns the truth, and she says, look, if you just if you just stop bullshitting me for one second, I'll go back to, to, to Jackson. Because if we're being entirely honest, she, she also loves him and admires him as a father in her heart. Which is the only reason she'd even go down the path that we watch her go down in this game. Um... She says, "Just tell me the god, just tell me the goddamn truth, and I'll go back to Jackson." And he says, "You were gonna die. I didn't want that. I stopped it." And she said, "All right, great. Um, thank you for finally being honest. But we're over." <laughs> she says, "We're done." And then you get that last moment, like the ending of this game. If we isolate everything else. From the very, very, very last scene, the ending is very consistent with The Last of Us. And I love that ending. It's it's bittersweet. It's it's heartfelt. And I think that that scene sticks the landing. It's just the fact that it shakes. Everything before that shakes people. Yeah. Because having that moment of, Oh, look, they were going to smooth everything over, except then he gets his head crushed. It is, is heartbreaking, and I think that's the, the core of the whole story. Um, we still love Joel. We still love Ellie. That, I think that's the thing people are struggling with right this minute, is that we don't, ha- we don't feel anything less for Ellie and Joel. Nothing, they're so perfect, which is a weird thing to say. They're so perfect of characters that nothing could have happened in this game to change our opinions of them. Yeah. But the rest of the story didn't do them justice, which is why people are resenting this game. Do you Do you think that's a fair assessment? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think... People would have been better off not getting a sequel and being mad about that rather than getting what we got and just not being satisfied with it. Um, Well, I mean, to play devil's advocate again, I don't think anybody was mad we didn't get a sequel until they announced a sequel. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, But what I. I could have lived my entire life with just The Last of Us 1 and been absolutely content because I loved both those characters from that game alone. I didn't need anything additional. When they announced it, I wanted them to do, to do those characters justice. And when when, it, when they just kind of slightly missed the target, did, did it make me sad? Yes. Am I in the same boat as everybody else? No, but do I understand where people like I'm, just, I keep just picking you and PewDiePie because it's easy. But people like you and PewDiePie, who are upset about the whole thing, do I understand it? Absolutely. Yeah, and you know the imagination is a very powerful thing. If you consider, if we had just gotten the first game, your imagination would always be running wild. Like I know that you were also even writing a short. I'm, I don't. I don't think it's. Your your short did it have anything to do with the events that followed the ending of the first Last of Us, or was it still like in mid story? Oh, uh, okay. Since I have to rework it anyway at this point, I'll dis- disclose a little bit of info about it. I wrote a short <laughs> where I gave backstory to the surgeon who was going to do the surgery, <laughs> aka at this point Abby's goddamn father. <laughs> Another reason to hate Abby. Continue. <laughs> Which don't get me wrong, I don't, I don't, I don't hold anything against Naughty Dog for this. I just think it's funny. Um, and it was, it was a minor, minor thing because I figured they'd go off on a random tangent with this game. I didn't think they were going to steer into this shit. Basically, <laughs> in my story, it was going to be that um, Ellie ran, uh, 
uh, crossed paths with the surgeon. I'm just going to spoil my own short. It's fine. I have to rework it anyway. Ellie and the surgeon were going to cross paths during the chunk where Joel is impaled by the thing and he he's on the verge of dying. And so the whole point of her running into the surgeon is that he was going to help her in that initial moment keep him alive. Essentially, this chance interaction with the, with, with the surgeon or the doctor heading toward where the fireflies were, um, he was going to be like, yeah, we got to get some drugs. We're going to go and we'll get them and we'll give them to your buddy and he'll survive. And he has no idea until, obviously, the surgery that Kelly is the one who who he has to operate on. And so the whole crux of it was that he would help her along the way and be like, yeah, let's go. We go to a hospital, find the drugs, save your friend. Cool. All right, well, I got to go later. And he goes off to uh, Salt Lake City, and she and Joel go on their path and go uh, deal with David and all that shit, and then they get to Salt Lake City. And the final scene of the short was going to be he scrubs in to do the surgery he walks in he sees ellie he goes oh god this is her and there's that moment of realization of i met her i don't know three months ago yeah (laughs) and uh i I mean i don't want to tell naughty dog that they kind of screwed the pooch but i think my story is a little bit better for that surgeon um as far as just emotional resonance because it's just sort of, uh, it's subtle, as opposed to very on the nose of, oh yeah, the girl who comes to kill Joel is the daughter of the guy who was supposed to do the surgery. Even saying that <laughs> gets you, like, irritated. <laughs> yeah, I, it almost seems like they were desperate for a story. And yeah, instead of coming up with something unique, they had to tie some threads together that mattered instead of saying, okay, well, what's the next chapter of their story? Which is why, again, I'm, I'm, I hate, like, it's almost like I'm pushing my ideas forward, but that's why I, I said before, at this point, I don't know if it was an hour ago, but I said that I would be more inclined to have the second part be, okay, what happens between these two characters? When Ellie fit, fit, finds out, even if she gets the gist that, hey, the guy whom I, I profess to love and share this long adventure with lied to me. And so you, you start experimenting with that distance. Um, and in the few moments that you see Joel, you sort of see like where his life is now. You know, the one precious person that he protected does not want to be around him. But then you kind of get that alternative motive of when Ellie hears that, hey, Joel might be in trouble. And again, if you want to tie some loose ends, you can't like, oh, um, the rest of David's men are out to get him. Or, uh, you know, a a group who stemmed from the Fireflies is out to get Joel because he took, you know, the, the, uh, the life away from humanity by, you know, not letting them operate on Ellie. You could have the tied some loose ends in that part if you wanted to. Um, but I just think that had you just focused on that of where these two characters go. And again, if Joel died, it would have been okay as long as it gets justified by the end. Um, because I think at that point it would still be a bittersweet ending because it's like, oh crap, does Ellie get to Joel before they have a chance to sort of rehash everything and talk about it and, you know, she could tell him that infamous line of, I can't forgive you, but I can try. You know? Yeah. Kind of giving that, again, because you, you don't want it to be fairy tale ending because that, that's, that's, in a post-apocalyptic world, that's nearly impossible, especially in this one. But it, it just, it seems like a desperate thing of like, hey guys, we desperately need a story. Well, let's give that surgeon some backstory. It's like, okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, man, what a mess, honestly. Seriously. Uh, it's just a mess. Um, at this point, I guess my final sentiments are this. Last of Us 1 is still my favorite game in the whole world. I plan to go back to that game once every two or three months that's usually like the the little pattern that i the routine that i've fallen into since being introduced to the game Um, especially 
cleanse your palate after part two. <laughs> <laughs> um, part two, I don't plan on touching anytime soon. Could this change one day? Maybe. I don't know. Never say never, honestly. But um, my final, final sentiment is, Naughty Dog, you didn't deliver. And I said this before release, the bar, the first one set out, was very, very high. Very, very high. Um, had it been one of those games where it's like, you know, this game, the first part was good, but it just it kind of needs a kick in the ass, I'd be like, okay, maybe I would have been a little bit more forgiving. But the fact that the first game is honestly, in my eyes, a masterpiece. And it gives you the ending that it gives you without being blunt of good ending, bad ending. Um, I think it made everything work. And the second one honestly just rips that all apart and just goes in a completely different direction that was not needed nor desired. So my personal opinion, take it or leave it, is part two didn't deliver for me. And part one is where it's at. That's it. Your thoughts. And at, and at this point, I'll jump in to give my final thoughts. Um, like you said, you used, the, you used the word masterpiece. The first game is masterpiece. The second one, although being built that way by a lot of the reviews, I do, I, I'll, I'll concede... I think misses the mark. Yeah. Overall, are there things about it where if you were like, okay, let's look at all the games ever <laughs> and say what has the best environment? This one's amazing. This is like top three of games uh, with the environment. Yeah. And I'm not going to go too deep down that rabbit hole, but that's just to paint an example. There's certain things that this game is amazing at. Yeah. And there's certain things they definitely miss the mark on, such as sticking the landing or pacing their story or cutting it properly. Um, will I probably go back and play the game again? Yes. Will I do it anytime soon? Probably not, mostly because I'm busy. <laughs> but I'm not doing it. I'm not not playing the game again out of resentment. I'm playing it out of the fact that it's a long ass game and I have other shit to do. Um, but I maintain that I love Ellie, I love Joel, and no, nothing is going to change that. Nothing is going to tarnish that. I have zero resentment for buying the Ellie edition and getting that statue, getting the backpack for my cosplay, the bracelet for my cosplay. Um, I don't know if I've told you this, but one of my coworkers, coworkers is buying everything but the, <laughs> the book bag and bracelet from me so that I've got backups for my cosplay of Ellie, because, you know, I did a gender-bend cosplay of Ellie. Yeah. Um, so I have extra accessories at this point, because that's how much I care about that character, is that I want to be able to, if I'm going to perform the character, if I have the backpack and the backpack breaks, I want a second one. But um, the overall experience is not the end of the world. I don't have a problem with the game as a standalone. Did it stick the landing as the last of us game? No, uh, but we've said that four times. What I want to boil this down to is, what is your final rating? One to ten. I'm going to... You, did, you didn't know I was going to do this. No, I didn't. <laughs> um, and just considering everything that I think you, you summoned everything up right there, graphics, gameplay, pacing, delivery of a sequel, all that considered, um, with, with like not being nice, but not being just, you know, not just trashing the whole thing. Um, I'm going to have to give it a four out of 10. Okay. That's, that's fair. I'm not going to attack you for your rating. Um, and you? I'm trying to I'm I'm trying to leverage or not leverage. I'm trying to level. Because uh, I know a lot of the, the stuff I've read online is that obviously a lot of reviewers are kind of 
strong armed into giving a perfect review where, look, if you don't give us a 10 out of 10, you're not going to get to review the next one. Nobody's come to me and said, Hey, do you want to play the last of us too early? So I don't care. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) but I'll give it, I'll give it a six out of 10. Okay. For overall experience, because of the fact that there's a, there are a lot of good things, even things you don't like that, uh, I found a way to like such as, uh, and I didn't talk about this at any point during this, but walking through the stadium where the wolves all live, seeing the children going to school, which was an un- unnecessary detail, but it was a nice detail. Yeah. Seeing the kids going to class, going down onto the field where the dogs and the farm and everything is. All the attention to detail wins, wins this game extra points for me. Because while it doesn't matter to the overall story, it is really cool that they considered all of it. Yeah, and I, I think that like I'm very happy that the first 15 or 20 minutes we talked about that. Uh, and th- and that's why I it kind of earned a, a, those few points for me was graphics, mechanics, acting, the cutscenes, uh, regardless of context, very very good acting. Um, the the fa- I I can't tell you the last time that a game made me emotional or teary. Um, it's a I I, don't, I can't even tell you it's a count on a one hand's list. Um, so the fact that this game did that for me, I think, tells you that it d- it did something right. It evoked some type of emotion, as opposed to going through it with a deadpan face. Um, so in, in that aspect, yes, they delivered the acting, the voice acting, the graphics, the mechanics. Um, even like, um, to, just to dive into this for just one quick second, um, there were certain moments where when you would kill someone... And even though you shot them and they're presumably dead, they would almost have a slow death where after you shoot them and they fall to the ground, they're still screaming like five seconds afterwards. And, and at first I'm thinking, wait a second, that doesn't match up for me. The, the, the person is dead. Why are they still screaming? But then I kind of connected in my mind. I'm like, well, you know, there are moments where depending on how you get shot you might still be alive for a few seconds while you're bleeding mm-hmm. out. So that part of it, it's like, I like that. I like that attention to detail because, you know, it's not just copy-paste for all, like, all the deaths for all the, for all the enemies. Every person dies differently. So, I, again, going back to your point, it's a very tedious detail, but the fact that it's in the game is pretty cool. Um, yeah. The anim- and uh, I want to chime in on that real quick because I saw a video that talked about that in the scene in Haven when you're playing as Abby and you're attacking the wolves. A lot of times they'll call you out by name and be like, Abby, what are you doing? And then they'll die. Yeah. So The confusion part of it. Yeah. Integrating that into the character responses is, again, a really cool detail. Yeah, and I think that's something that Naughty Dog does best, is attention to detail. So I, I'm not going to take that away from them. I was always taught, no matter how much you like or dislike something, give it credit where credit's due. So, um, and that, that's why it earns a few points with me. I can appreciate those. Um, but because the, the pacing and, more importantly, the story for me just lacks, it gets, it gets deducted a few points, which is why I landed on a 4 out of 10. So... Well, um, and that's and that's fair. That's that's difference of opinion. I'm not going to attack you for a four out of ten when I gave it a six out of ten. So. <laughs> yeah, I think, and that's the beautiful part is that no matter what podcast or any time, if we're just having general conversation, I never had a problem that if we ever reached to a point where it was okay, Dan, we can agree to disagree. I never had a problem with that. I'm not one of those people where you know what? If I say something this way, you have to see it the same way. Um, yeah. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about base is that we, we can we can have that differing of opinion and it, and that's okay because there is no clear right and wrong here. It's just all based like it's all subjective. Yeah. So, so yeah, all in all, we got 
game averages out to a 5 out of 10. It's not a bad game. It's not a great game. It's a game. Yeah, um, which I think is is a little bit shocking because it, on our final episode before this had, you told me that this is what we would have been, this is how things would have played out. I would have been like, get out of here. You're delusional. But um, sometimes things play out a little bit differently than what you had expected. Um, God bless Naughty Dog and Neil Druckmann. They put in a lot of effort into this. But, a lot of time and effort, yeah. Yeah, but just in some people's eyes, it didn't pan out. Some people, you know, I'm still seeing comments of people going, perfect game, amazing game, 10 out of 10. So they have that. Um, but it just, I think that, it, I think you said it best. They kind of missed the mark um, in yeah. some aspects. So. And, and I, hope the, I think the only thing we can really hope for at this point is that I know I've seen a couple of posts about Neil kind of pushing back against criticisms because granted, I think some of the criticism is out of line or is misplaced. So essentially, based on all of that going on and things like PewDiePie causing Neil to react and say, this isn't true, this isn't true, this isn't true, and just kind of acting irritated, my hope is that Neil and Naughty Dog, especially in the development of this HBO television show or a potential third episode to this game takes to heart the criticism i don't like they don't need to look at it and be like sorry no, no no they need to take to heart the criticism if they look at it and go these people are overreacting then they're going to piss people off more yeah um and so they need to take this criticism to heart, acknowledge it, and develop from there. Because if they don't, they're going to further alienate people. They're going to piss people off. And they're just going to further tarnish the plot. And then you're going to... They run the risk. And I, I hate to draw this HBO comparison. They run the risk of going down the path of the Game of Thrones. People loved Game of Thrones from seasons one to seven. And season eight was polarizing. Last of Us 2 was like the first half of season eight. So essentially they need to figure out if they want to be the, uh, if they want to be Game of Thrones or if they want to salvage themselves. Yeah, which is why at this point I'm thinking Last of Us is better left alone. Yeah. Because I feel like the more that we tinker with it, the more that we try to rectify what happened, the the the, the more you're going to the more it's going to become convoluted. Um but no, I do definitely agree with you. And I know you said this that they, you know, if they're doing a TV show or if they're taking into uh, consideration the response from the fans pay attention don't just you know wave it off and go oh these these people don't know what they're talking about um, or that they're just lashing out because they weren't happy with the second game no 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 no. take your fans into consideration guys because they do matter yeah i mean and, and again that should be done with moderation i'm not saying pay attention to the one guy who on twitter expresses his displeasure of oh because joel died i turned off the game no i'm not exactly. you know like I'm, that's not what i'm suggesting but like, he, like for example not, not to put you on the spot you hated the fact that joel died initially but you played through the rest of the game because you you needed to see what else happened yeah because and i mean because i didn't tell you what else happened yeah, because, I mean, while Joel is dead, Ellie is still alive. So, I mean, it's it's a package deal. Last of Us is a package deal. It's not just the Joel story. It's the Ellie story as well. Yeah, and like, like, we've, like we've addressed, Joel's death was very important to the rest of the plot of this game. And the way that they wrapped it up didn't do it justice. But I understand why they did it in the first place. Yeah, so... Again, you can't satisfy everybody, but if you have the majority of your review saying very long, very extensive, could have been short, um, 
try to not do this as much, try to get rid of this, try to explore this. I would say at least consider it. Um, because again, while you can't satisfy and make everybody happy, you can definitely consider everybody's thoughts if you're going for a third game or if you're going for the TV show or, or whatever the, the deal is. Yeah. Yeah, so... Wow, I think this has been our longest and most analytical episode, but... Oh, right... ab- absolutely. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> rightfully so, you know, when, when you spend seven or eight months talking about everything and uh, with everything that's that's been said and done and with the, with the dust settling at this point in time, um, I wouldn't have it any other way. Um, simply Not be- to mention, I think a 25 to 30 hour game, if... If your review is only two hours, I think that's still enough to say something. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I mean, don't don't be mistaken. A lot of these YouTubers, they, they condense everything because they... It, uh, chances are, if a viewer sees a Last of Us review for two hours, they might be a little bit hesitant to click on the video, but since the focus of this podcast is to to really dig deep and give an honest and thorough review, I mean, that's what we're doing. We're not going to pull any punches. With all this said, I once again, on behalf of Dan, the man, and myself, we would like to thank... That's me. I mean, I'm not yourself. I'm Dan, the man, but you get the point. Do I, though? I don't know. Did Naughty Dog... (sighs) Triggers. Um, but in all honesty, on behalf of us, get it, us, last of us, um, on behalf of us, we would like to thank everybody who's embarked on this journey with us. Uh, don't be mistaken. This is, (laughs) there it is again. This is not the last of, you know, this, all the puns (laughs) unintentionally, but this is not the last of, (laughs) Of us Just talking say, about <laughs> this is not the last of us talking about video games. There we're we gonna go. we're gonna embark on other series. We've gone through two K. We've gone through Last of Us, but um, we want to think more content is to follow. More content is to follow just sporadically and just with time. Um, in all honesty, while we have while we just spend time talking about a, a pandemic game. Uh, there is a real pandemic going on in the world right now, and we would like to encourage everybody to be safe out there, wear masks at all times, be careful who you're around, wash hands, you know, uh, during uh, various parts of the day, and um, just no matter what you're doing, stay safe. And with all that said... Uh, no matter what time of day it is, no matter what day of the week it is, no matter what month of the year it is, and no matter what year it is, always remember and never forget, whenever you're in doubt, just turn down that treble. And turn up the bass. We'll see you guys next time.